Fora TV. The world is thinking. What I'd like to argue uh, simply is that Eric Schmidt of Google is wrong. Uh, that in fact there's nothing inherent in technology that requires the adjustment of our expectations of privacy. I want to suggest that across the range of surveillance technologies in the private and public sector, it's possible to design them in ways that protect privacy and security at the same time, or in ways that threaten privacy without increasing security. But this ultimately is not a technological question, it's a political one. Is there a political and cultural demand for a well-balanced uh, and well-designed technology of surveillance? And I'm afraid that as Britain and America, which have very different attitudes historically toward surveillance, uh, converge and become more like each other, it may be less rather than more likely that the well-designed technologies will in fact be adopted. So what do I mean when I say that the magic bullet or the silver bullet is attainable and it's possible to design these technologies in ways that protect privacy and security at the same time? A simple, easily grasped example, this is the example of the naked machine. This is the high-tech, three-dimensional, millimeter imaging machine that was deployed at Heathrow Airfor Airport uh, not long after 9-11. It reveals not only metal, but any objects that are concealed under clothing. Wonderful security device. The only downside is that it shows us stark naked. Now, the naked machine does not have to be designed in this way. Uh, more recently, at the Phoenix Airport in Arizona, uh, the people who designed it came up with a simple programming shift. They took the pictures of the contraband and projected onto, onto a mannequin, a sexless mannequin, and then they took the pictures of the naked body and scrambled it into a nondescript blob. So this wonderful alternative, the blob machine, as opposed to the naked machine, is obviously for most of us an act of mercy. Much better to be a blob than to be naked in the airport. Uh, and it's also a, a silver bullet that protects just as much security without threatening privacy. Now, I am convinced that the range of security uh, technologies uh, that have been adopted since 9-11 can be designed in ways that look more like the blob machine than the naked machine. And I want to give, I want to begin with an optimistic story about a data mining technology that was refined in a good way, and then I want to end with a less optimistic story uh, about the proliferation of surveillance cameras which have not been uh, refined uh, in a similarly encouraging way. What's the happy story about data mining? Not soon after 9-11, uh, the government proposed to create a grand centralized database that would unite uh, data collected by the private sector, emails, consumer patterns, magazine subscriptions, uh, tie them into public sector data about arrest records, child support payments, and so forth, and profile everyone who checked into an American airport uh, based on their resemblances to the 9-11 terrorists. Uh, what was wrong with this system? It wouldn't have worked and it posed grave threats to privacy, but aside from that, it was a great system. It wouldn't have worked for the simple reason that if the next attack looks nothing like the last one and you're profiling people who buy one-way tickets and take flying lessons in Florida, uh, then you're going to miss the train bombers. Uh, the, the, the threats to privacy are uh, also acute, uh, and they have to do with the dangers of political uh, discriminatory surveillance. Uh, if the government can dust a protest scene, plug the fingerprints into the database and identify everyone who is there and then threaten them with prosecution for being late on their tax payments, it might have a great window of uh, opportunities for discriminatory surveillance. Unless you think this is a paranoid fantasy, President Nixon did it against Vietnam protesters and uh, protesters at the Republican National Convention in New York were similarly threatened with surveillance pictures. So this fear of the Nixon effect is a real one uh, and it uh, uh, informs the privacy debate. My story is a happy one because the total information awareness system, as it was clumsily called, was refined in ways that avoided both of these dangers. First, the government changed it from a system of profiling to one of authentication. So everyone who checked in was just confirmed that they had a stable identity, that they were who they said they were, but uh, they weren't compared to the consumption patterns of the 9-11 terrorists. And in terms of privacy, the government uh, imposed a control on the use of data. Uh, the data could not be shared with criminal law enforcement, and therefore you couldn't be prosecuted for being late on your child support payments. Only if you had an outstanding warrant for a serious crime could you be kept off the plane. Both of these were serious victories for privacy uh, based on models that the Germans have used to great effect uh, in imposing limits on the use of data. Uh, and they show that vigorous political opposition, which in America is defined not only by the civil libertarian left, but also the libertarian right can converge to create well-designed data mining systems. 
Uh, my second story is less optimistic, uh, and this is the story of the proliferation of surveillance cameras. And here the cultural differences are very great. You in Britain have lived with these cameras since the 1990s. You take them for granted now. You are the most <coughs> surveilled uh, country uh, in Europe. I was struck when I first studied the surveillance cameras by the gap between their promise, mainly they were sold as an instrument of fighting terrorism, but quickly came to be used for very different purposes, mostly keeping people out of shopping malls if they'd misbehaved, scaring people into thinking they were being watched if they weren't, creating databases of supposed shoplifters and so <laughs> forth. And also I was struck by the fact that the debate was remarkably unempirical. Uh, the British and American government's own surveys have shown no connection between the proliferation of cameras and the decline of either violent crime or terrorism. They may be slightly useful in detecting crime after it occurs, but there was no really real effort to weigh the cost and benefits of the technologies as a detection tool. Were they more or less effective than old-fashioned human intelligence? Instead, because they made people feel good, because people were afraid and wanted an illusion of safety, they embraced the cameras, whether or not they actually were effective in fighting serious crime. Uh, for me, the story is instructive because it reveals the deep differences in British and American attitudes toward privacy and surveillance. I have always asked myself, why did Britain become the first wired country during the 1990s at a time when America largely resisted the cameras? My colleagues and I were just discussing this before we spoke. I'm eager for your thoughts, too. It was suggested uh, the very different uh, British attitude toward authority. The British left has been less suspicious of the state than the American civil libertarian left. A greater culture of uh, fair play and a trust that the authorities will do the right thing. And also, please tell me if I'm wrong here, the British uh, experience with the class system and a greater tolerance of hierarchy might lead to greater tolerance of technologies that put people in their place. For after all, what we're talking about here is not merely threats to privacy. These are technologies of classification and exclusion. You can come in or out. Your behavior in the future will be predicted based on your behavior in the past. The book of Orwell that seems most relevant to me here is not 1984, but the English people. Orwell noted uh, back in the 30s that class, exaggerated class distinctions are diminishing, but it's still possible to place the great majority of people by their manner and accent and so forth. That's a hypothesis for why they took in England sooner than in America. In America, initially, after 9-11, the cameras were proposed, a British-style system was proposed, and it was resisted by the same coalition of civil libertarian liberals and libertarian conservatives who've proposed uh, either not licking the cameras at all or uh, uh, constraining them by putting limits on the use of data and the degree to which it could be shared and so forth. Uh, for me, that showed the resilience of the American civil libertarian culture. Imagine my surprise when after the London bombings, uh, these limitations were abandoned and New York is now proposing to construct a British style system. There may be slightly more restraints than you have here, but the two cultures are converging. So this is the point on which I want to end. Uh, it is uh, possible uh, as Britain becomes more uh, democratic, less hierarchical, the same urge for technologies of exposure that make my face, my, my space, and other social networking technologies so popular may uh, create an expectation of a culture of exposure that will encourage the proliferation of the technologies. And as America becomes more deferential to authority, they may tolerate surveillance systems that they would have rejected. But I want to end, and this is the important note, uh, never believe for a moment that privacy is over, uh, uh, get over it. There will be a scandal, a celebrity will be kept off a plane, someone will be judged out of context, and perhaps too late we'll begin to realize some of what we've lost in a culture of ubiquitous surveillance where people's ability to control the conditions of their own exposure, for that's what people want, it's control, not privacy, are seriously threatened. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.